Three weeks until voting begins and still no maps. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Herb Asher, OSU political scientist, and Michael Miller, former Franklin County prosecutor. Ohio voters can start casting ballots in 25 days. That's when early voting begins, and they still don't know who they will vote for when it comes to state legislature and Congress. Another week has passed and still no word from the Ohio Supreme Court on the constitutionality of Ohio House and Senate maps, nor the congressional map. Legislative leaders are sticking with this tight timeline, refusing to move the primary or schedule a second one. So Julie Carr Smythe, as of late Friday afternoon, we still have not heard from the Ohio Supreme Court. Do we have any idea what the holdup is or is it just the court taking its time? Well, um, it's not so much taking their time as that they had to give opportunity for the parties to uh, oppose and object to the most recent round of maps. And then they had to give enough days for the other parties to reply. And so that process is, is coming uh, along, I guess. But they we've also seen from all the courts involved in this that they are not really interested in rushing things in order to accommodate the legislature. It's the legislature's job to move the primary should they choose to do so. And, and the courts are uh, sort of adamantly sticking to their own guns. Mm -hmm. Herb Asher, as you see this, you know, go, go on and whether it's a delay or just due process and taking deliberative time, uh, how do you read the process right now? What do you think happens when, they, when the, the decisions do come out? Well, of course I agree with Julie that uh, the courts are doing the appropriate thing of letting the, the contesting parties have their say. If we need to delay the primary, we can. Uh, the threat about the primary should, is not really a meaningful threat to force the court to rush its decisions. And what's getting more frustrating now is that I'm hearing more and more excuses why, in fact, the court shouldn't act. The court should wait till after the November election uh, to take care of uh, the congressional districts. And it sounds a little like the post-2020 uh, presidential campaign where lawyers for the losing candidate were trying to come up with so many different excuses or cases or arguments or legal theories for why, in fact, the election should not be certified. Uh, the court will make its decision. I don't know what it will decide, uh, but it is the case. And keep in mind, it was the legislature itself, and particularly the Republicans in the legislature, because they didn't want the Democrats to be court shopping, they put into the constitutional amendment that the Ohio Supreme Court would be the judicial body that would make the final decision. Yeah. So it's now where it's supposed to be, and we'll have to wait and see what we get. There were a couple of decisions this week by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in cases out of North Carolina and Pennsylvania. The U.S. Supreme Court said the Supreme Courts in those states they can they can draw maps, uh, yeah. and Herb, that has to be good news for uh, for Democrats and, and supporters of good government groups yeah. and bad and, news and for, for the League of Women Voters yeah. and the other good government groups. Yeah, no, the court refused to uh, hear cases from those two states, and so in fact, the decisions of the Supreme Courts of those states are, are in fact uh, the final decision, and the same thing could very well happen here in Ohio. Yeah. Michael Miller, what, what do you make of this? Is this what do you make of this? It's just gone on for months now, and we're, we're right up against it. The military ballots, there may be a little bit more uh, wiggle room there to get those ballots out, should they be able to do it. But even that's looking more and more unlikely. Well, I don't know, Mike, other the usual infighting among the parties, you know, they can't get along with each other. They can't seem to do anything. I sometimes wonder about the whole system, uh, how it's operating, because everybody gets in a corner and that's it. The U.S. Supreme Court decisions were interesting. Uh, you, you didn't mention Alabama, where it went the other way. Alabama, I think, was challenged, challenged by the Democrats. The other two were challenged yeah. by the Republicans. And uh, that's the way it's going to be all over the country. Uh, whoever's in a minority is going to claim it's unfair, and, and off you go. So yeah. uh, eventually, I, I suppose, if they have to delay this thing, I don't see that's going to be particularly critical. It may cost a little more money, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be a major problem. 
Uh, I agree that the Ohio Supreme Court's going to take their time, and if they get it done in time to have the primary when it's set, fine. If they don't, the legislature will move it back, I don't know, a month or so, and, and we'll do it then. Yeah. You know, what, what's interesting is we're focused on Ohio, Julie Carr Smythe, and um, we're talking about how Republicans here are controlling the process. But in New York, uh, it's even more gerrymandered than Ohio. It's like 85 percent of the congressional seats are held by Democrats. Granted, New York's a bit more Democratic than the, than we are Republican. But still, the New York Times had a piece this week saying that Democrats have really done a good job this time around in, in gerrymandering the, the, the states they control. So to help them perhaps either hold on to Congress or only lose a slight uh, number of seats to, to the Republicans. Right. I mean, gerrymandering is, is a proposition that it, each party will do when they have the opportunity. This is why some states uh, have opted for systems where the politicians aren't in charge, uh, because it's natural to want to uh, bring yourselves into power or keep power uh, when you have it. And um, that's what we've seen here in Ohio, for sure, is, uh, you know, whether it's the uh, it's it's the reading of the Constitution by the Republicans, or it's simply the defending of their turf. Uh, they most certainly have drawn maps uh, so far that have not have not really been fair to the forty six percent of Ohio voters who are Democrats. Yeah, we'll see. Mike, as you were saying, yeah. throughout the country, you know, the parties in control have taken advantage. Uh, uh, there was a story in Tennessee, the city of Nashville, for the first time in 146 years, is now being split into three congressional districts. Why? Because the Republican legislature decided it doesn't want a Democratic seat in Nashville. Texas, where the Republicans thought they were going to pick up a lot, it turns out the legislature there basically drew non-competitive districts that actually protected incumbents of the uh, Democratic and Republican parties, and the Republicans may pick up a couple of seats in Texas, but not the number they could have. As you mentioned about New York, the Democrats just did a, a massive gerrymandering, putting Staten Island in with Park Slope in Brooklyn. And so, but what's different about Ohio is the voters of Ohio passed two constitutional amendments in recent years saying, we don't want you to continue to do this. And so that's really what's driving this right now. It's really the constitutional amendments approved by the voters. So this is not about the convenience of legislators. It's not even about the convenience of election officials. You can always delay the primary. It's about actually giving voters districts that are not excessively gerrymandered. All right, we'll see how it all turns out. Meanwhile, the campaigns continue. Jim Renacci is out with a new ad where he shakes Donald Trump's hand twice. He attacks Governor DeWine. The governor says thanks, but no thanks to a debate with Renacci and other GOP rivals. And a new poll shows businessman Mike Gibbons leads, although barely, the U.S. Senate race. The Fox News poll shows Gibbons with a narrow lead over Josh Mandel. They're basically tied at 20, 22 percent. J.D. Vance is next at 11 percent. Jane Timken is at nine. And State Senator Matt Dolan is at seven. A quarter of Republican primary voters, though, remain undecided. Mike Miller, you know, Mike Gibbons is, he's a political unknown for the most part. He's, he, he's made some noise in the recent years, but he has climbed to the top thanks to those good, well, you may, you may not agree with them, but they are good ads targeting the Republican primary voter. Would you agree? Mike Miller? Well, I, I would say all the ads I've seen, and I'm sure you guys are the same, we watch the same thing. Gibbons has had these ads on literally for months. Uh, and I suppose the second most that I've seen, uh, which has started recently, maybe uh, three weeks ago, is Mandel. Yeah. And I think these uh, polls kind of reflect that. So far as I've seen, uh, Vance has had relatively uh, very few commercials. I don't know that I've seen one from Jane Temkin. Uh, if I have, it's made no impression on me. So, uh, you know, there's so many people who are undecided and so on. I, I'm not sure that simply because it has given, I think, with 22 percent and Mandela 20, that they're, they're the only two. Um, and Frank, I, I know that both are pushing uh, for the Trump votes. 
they may split them and somebody else may camp come in. It's it's very early yet, I think. I know it's late, but it's early. Yeah, there's, there's still a lot of time left. It could be even more time if they bump the primary to, to June. Julie Carsmith, you have to figure that Josh Mandel, with all those undecideds, with his name ID, he has a sort of a built-in advantage there. Folks aren't really familiar with these folks, and with these candidates, and then they go to vote on whether it's May 3rd or in sometime in June. Right, I feel like at this point, uh, I mean, I think that um, Mike has a good point that the uh, what we're seeing right now is just campaign strategy. Who decided to go out first? Who's holding back? Who's got their money in the can that they're waiting to spend? Uh, what are the super PACs going to do? And really, the voters are often not paying attention even at this close date to the primary and they'll wait until the run up and and start studying you know a couple of weeks before they have to go to the polls and so i think that the gibbons lead is largely reflecting that right now um and i've seen jd vance going out with kind of a positive uh, almost biographical ad for the first time this past week uh and, and i think it's true jane timken hasn't really been out there other than a bunch of attacks on her uh, by super PACs uh, behind Josh Mandel. So um, it'll be interesting to see um, how that shakes up as the campaigns really gear up. Herb Asher, we only have a, a month or so left if the primary is held in May. Do you see any of these candidates pulling out at this point? I mean, J.D. Vance or Jane Timken, they're, according to this poll, pretty far behind. It's getting kind of late for them to pull out. Uh, it would certainly disappoint some of their supporters and contributors, but, uh, and it's not likely that if you pull out, you can somehow transfer your support to another candidate. And very clearly, I think the top three candidates are not going to pull out. They're the three who in fact are talking most about being Trump loyalists, if you will. And I think maybe in the next month uh, or longer, uh, the reporters might start asking some additional questions of the candidates about where they stand. Uh, what do I think about Ukraine? Uh, because remember, these are candidates for the US Senate. Yep. They could wind up on the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee or the Senate Defense Committees or whatever. So, and the reason I mentioned that, of course, is J.D. Vance made uh, one of the dumbest comments or insensitive comments when he said, I think it's ridiculous we're focused on this border in Ukraine. I gotta be honest with you. I don't really care what happens in Ukraine one way or the other. Yeah. Now, how can you say, I mean, it's one thing to say it's not our issue. I don't want to get involved, but to say you don't care one way or the other, but think about this, that uh, initially Donald Trump said, uh, you know, well, Putin was brilliant, smart. Trump has since said, oh, this is an atrocity and is blaming Biden. But if you think about what's happened in the last five years, it certainly was uh, Trump who was, I'm trying to think of the, a phrase I can use that doesn't get us in trouble, kissing up to Putin. It was Trump who was trying to put the blame on Ukraine for election interference. Uh, and now all these candidates are so saying, I'm with Trump. I'm with Trump on all of this. I think it would be interesting to, for reporters to be asking, what should happen in Ukraine? Yeah, and uh, and at least see where their sympathies lie. Yeah, and that may be an issue that I think will come back to haunt JD Vance because I think that's a quote that his opponents can use quite, I think, effectively. You don't care what happens. The yeah, many 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 presidents from uh, George W. Bush to Obama to uh, Trump and now Biden have had to deal with. Uh, President Putin, and uh, no one has really figured it, out, figured it out yet. So it's really truly a bipartisan issue that has wracked this country and Europe anyway. Uh, looking at the governor's race, uh, Michael Miller, good news for Mike DeWine. The same Fox poll had Governor DeWine at 50 percent, followed by Joe Blystone and then uh, Jim Renacci at 18 percent. Only 10 percent undecided in that race. But uh, Mike uh, Miller, Mike DeWine has to be pleased that he's at 50 percent because he's been bumping around the you know, 30 percent range. 20% in previous, you know, internal polls we've seen. Well, I'm sure he is pleased and uh, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, when you talk about name recognition, which so many of these races uh, stress, uh, you know, DeWine's been around for a long, long time in about every position we can think of, governor to senator, to prosecutor, to lieutenant governor, all kind of things. 
So I, I'm not surprised at all that he's got that lead. Uh, his opponents are still basically uh, more area type people. I, I suppose uh, Renacci has got the most uh, name recognition, but not much. And I, I think DeWine, for the most part, at least amongst the Republicans, uh, people are quite satisfied with him, with the exception of the uh, mass people who are not. Uh, so I don't think there's anything uh, surprising about that. I'm sure he's happy. Uh, as an incumbent, I don't think it was a surprise that he said he will not debate uh, for this primary race. Uh, my guess is he will debate if he wins the primary and, say, uh, Ryan wins for the Democrats. I imagine they will debate. But uh, I think he'll just sit quietly now and figure he's he's certainly going to win the primary. That's yeah. the way he looks at it. And then we'll see what happens in November. Yeah, Nan, Nan Whaley and John Cranley would, would, would face, one of those folks would face uh Mike DeWine, of course, and then Mike, uh, T Tim Ryan is in the Senate race. Uh, let's get to our next topic. It's been two years and two days for instance, since the first reported COVID case in Ohio. Since then, 37,146 Ohioans have died from the virus. Now it appears the pandemic is fading fast. In January, Ohio saw 2,200 cases per 100,000 people. Now the state's transmission rate stands at 78, just 78 per 100,000 people. The situation is improving and our experience with COVID-19 is evolving from that of a pandemic to more of an endemic state. This week, the state of Ohio announced it would switch from daily to weekly reporting of COVID-19 data. The city of Columbus officially ended its mask mandate this week. Herb Asher, some are saying it's a little too soon, especially with the data. They'd like to see that, that continue to be reported daily. What do you think about that? I think these are the right decisions that we're making now. Everybody is tired. Everybody is looking to get back to normal. Uh, the good news is, you know, we are monitoring the number of cases. And so if we see a reversal, if we see a surge, I think we'll be better prepared to address that. But I think right now, uh, we'll be, we'll get, we'll, easing the mask mandate, so there's an exception at the federal level in terms of transportation, but easing the mass mandates and still encouraging people to get vaccinated. One of the questions that still has not been addressed is, will people need another booster shot? Uh, many people who got their first booster shot got it more than six months ago. Yeah. Uh, so we'll need advice from the doctors and the CDC. But I think this easing up, it's happening across the country, but we still need to monitor. Yeah, it's Julie Carr Smythe. They're going to be monitoring folks county by county, the state. So they're going to look for hot spots around the county, Julie. Exactly. Yes. Um, and I think that makes sense, you know, to begin to drill down a, at the more local level and uh, have us get accustomed to these charts with the, on the different doors of, of the institutions with colors like orange and yellow and red so that you know, okay, today I, maybe I should wear my mask in, inside to a, a gathering or continue to wear my mask if I'm in a big group or something like that. But, you know, the idea uh, is to begin to return to normal um, and that people who are going to get sick aren't going to get too sick. You know, um, I think I'm going to get the, the winning uh, the winning re designation as the final person to get the COVID uh, virus because I got it this past week after everything opened back up after two years of not be getting it. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, the risks are less with Omicron, more people are vaccinated and, uh, you know, it, it, we have to move on at some point. And thanks, Julie, for plowing through and appearing on Columbus on the Record <laughs> this week, even though you're <laughs> overcoming, <Remotely. laughs> overcoming COVID, yes. Um, uh, Mike Miller, what are you gonna remember most about this, uh, this pandemic the past two years? It seems like a lifetime. Well, it does, Mike. I suppose like anybody else, you remember the uh, unbelievable amount of deaths that have occurred across the country. Uh, it's just overwhelming and something that I uh, have not had any experience with in my life. And I don't think the country has, save going back to the Spanish flu in 1919 or whatever that was. Um, personally, I suppose that with that as an exception, which is my personal things that are very minor, but my wife and I, for years, we've been married almost 56 years. We always go out Friday night for dinner and so forth. 
And uh, we sit in here for one solid year, a solid year and win nowhere. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't kill one another. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think in times it was close. <laughs> so I remember that, the things that just kind of change your entire lifestyle, your way of living and going to work. Yeah. Uh, it was almost all, you know, through uh, yeah. uh, non you know, not in person going there, doing all outside and, and the courts changing and everybody, it, it, it just changed everything. It yeah. changed everything I did and, uh, and everybody else too. Yeah. We'll remember for a long, a lot of missed memories over the past two years, whether you were a, a high school graduate or, a, you know, a senior citizen who's looking to, you know, enjoy the rest of uh, the last, you know, decades of your of your life. It's just it's been a long time. Anyway, remember that long debate over Ohio's gasoline tax from the before times? Well, it's back with gas prices topping four dollars a gallon. Senate Republicans want to peel back the gas tax approved in 2019. It's about 10 cents a gallon. Lawmakers also want to waive the one hundred dollar yearly charge for hybrid vehicles and the two hundred dollar charge for electric vehicles. The tax and the fees would come back after five years. Supporters say Ohio doesn't need the money to fix highways because of all that federal government infrastructure money that's coming our way. Governor DeWine disagrees. He says the state needs the gas tax money still. Julie Carr Smythe, when you're paying $4 a gallon, 10 cents doesn't seem like a whole lot. Is this more of a symbolic move or are lawmakers genuinely trying to, to help folks with their gas, gasoline bills? I think it's somewhere in the middle there. Um, I think that uh, the gas tax can be seen right now as adding to uh, other bills that are are being impacted by the situation uh, with inflation and everything else, and that they want to do something nice for for people. But um, to some extent, it's uh, it's symbolic uh, for a lot of Ohioans. Uh, but it adds up, you know, and so, and so at, at a certain point, you know, every 10, 40 cents matters. Yeah. I mean, Mike Miller, if we're getting $10 billion from the feds, why stop at 10 cents? The entire Ohio gas tax is 38 cents per gallon. Why not just repeal the whole thing for maybe just two years? Well, the governor fought to have the increase in the tax, as you know, and I don't think he's going to want to go along with reducing it. And, you know, with inflation, as Julie mentioned, all that, I know prices are going off all over the place on everything, you know, meat, clothes, all, everything. Uh, this is the one that, that affects me less than any for a completely ancillary reason. And that is, uh, I think that uh, the 10 cents or 12 cents, whatever it is, that has been a directly attributed to the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, it, it makes me feel in a very limited way that I'm doing something. So I don't mind paying a tax. I don't like it, but uh, under these circumstances, it, I look at it differently than perhaps I would any other uh, tax. Yeah, Herb Asher, you know, this will be a temporary reprieve of the gas tax, but you know what happens after five years if you go to make it a permanent reprieve and you oppose that, you get accused of raising taxes. Do you think that could happen here? Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, I think good public policy here is to leave the gas tax alone or to really say that we're going to reduce it for a much shorter period of time and actually sort of you know sort of say there's an end date here so it isn't as if you're going to be raising taxes anew but uh and this is sort of a it, it's, it's a response to say inflation's a worry and we're trying to do something but the something isn't very much here and uh so I would think here that the governor you know, has a good argument to make that uh, we shouldn't be toying with this. And actually, the infrastructure needs, despite the fact that we have $10 billion from the federal government, uh, we, we have many, many needs in roads and highways and bridges in, in the state of Ohio. So that money still can be used very, very effectively. Yeah. All right. Let's get to our final off the record parting shots. And Michael Miller, we will start with you. Well, very briefly, Mike, everything we've talked about today, of course, is important, but uh, I think it pales with uh, what's going on in uh, Ukraine. And uh, I suppose that dominates uh, the news as it should and dominates my thoughts and just keep our fingers crossed that uh, things will work out there to the benefit of the Ukrainian people. All right. Uh, Herb Asher, your final thought. You know, 
if the final court decisions give the Democrats a set of districts that are more favorable to them than in the past, Democrats shouldn't assume that they're gonna, therefore gonna win more seats. They have to do a much better job in terms of candidate recruitment, running campaigns. Uh, they have not done a good job of uh, campaign financing. So favorable court decisions do not guarantee certain kinds of outcomes. All right. And Democrats and, need to be aware of that. And Julie Carr Smythe, your final thought. Yeah, I mean, just back to the uh, elections that we were talking about, you know, I think in both of this Senate primary on the Republican side and the governor's race, you know, the real question everyone is going to have to wait and see is, does the Trump magic, if you will, transfer to any other candidate than Trump? And I think that, that Ohio will be a great place to watch for that and see if uh, even with his endorsement or without his endorsement or uh, every possible a positive statement about him, uh, whether that carries a candidate through the finish line. Yeah, all the way to November. That'll be something really to watch. Uh, this is it. Ohio State University is the last, I think, big institution in Columbus to get rid of their mask mandate as of Friday afternoon. We're done. Let's hope we can keep them off for good. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. You can watch every episode on your time. Go to wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.